Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining. We're here to talk about the recently um, FDA approved Alzheimer's drug, Adjuhelm. And we're here to have some an expert uh, guest lecturer today, Dr. Michael Jeffy, tell us more about it and um, why it's being controversial, essentially. So Michael Jaffe is the vice chair of the Department of Neurology at the University of Florida and the Bob Paul Family Professor of Neurology, where he is the founding director of the Trauma, Concussion, and Sports Neuromedicine Program, otherwise known as TRACS. He's also developed an innovative multidisciplinary clinic and a state-of-the-art concussion research and education program. Prior to coming to UF, Dr. Jaffe spent 21 years in the U.S. Air Force, where he served in many capacities, including National Director of Defense and Veterans Brain Injury Center, where he managed a network of 18 different sites, and his team's efforts resulted in the publication of over 100 peer-reviewed articles, paving the way for developed medical research. Dr. Jaffe is board certified by the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology in the following specialties, neurology, psychiatry, sleep medicine, and brain injury medicine. He has additional certifications from the United uh, Council for Neurologic Subspecialties in Behavioral Neurology and Neuropsychiatry, as well as in Neural Repair and Rehabilitation. Dr. Jaffe has declared a significant part of his career to developing innovative educational and research collaborations between the Department of Defense, federal agencies, academic institutions, and other stakeholders, including the National Football League and the Alzheimer's Association. He served as a national consultant for multiple federal agencies and national professional organizations. And with that, I'll leave him to uh, take it from here. Uh, so thank you for that uh, generous introduction. Um, let me kind of see if I can pull up some slides here. And so uh, one of the things that my mission here for the uh, for several minutes is really just to kind of review the biology of Alzheimer's from a 40,000 foot view and that we can understand what the mechanism of action that is the target of this new medication. Uh, aducanumab is the, uh, is the actual official name of it and then the trade name is Aduhelm. And so we'll just start off by talking about just sort of cognitive aging in general, sort of a framework of this. And so a lot of our agencies, a lot of our centers at the University of Florida are actively engaged in studying this. And there's a whole host of things that go into uh, functional decline. Everything just from the aging process itself, the risk factors and comorbidities, as well as neurodegenerative diseases. And if you combine some of these things with neurodegenerative disease, it can have even a more rapid effect on decline. And what we're really kind of talking about today is a form of a neurodegenerative disease. That's what Alzheimer's is considered. And uh, that can sort of lead to dementia. And so there's lots of different de definitions of dementia that different people can use. But uh, for the purposes of tonight, I think we just think about it as a loss of the cognitive function as well as the functional ability. So you kind of have um, cognitive and a functional decline. And it's thought to be due to the structural changes in the brain that's caused by either disease or trauma. And we're going to talk about some of the mechanisms of that. Many different brain disorders can cause dementia, but of the neurodegenerative, neurodegenerative dementias, and the most common of all dementias is Alzheimer's which really is thought to account for more than 75% of the late life dementias. Uh, one of the things that I think people fairly understand pretty well is that age is definitely a risk factor. And uh, once you get above the age of 65, the risk of developing Alzheimer's doubles at least uh, every five years. And so if you take a look at the current demographics of our current population in the United States, because of the aging population, it's a real concern. And you can just see kind of the the opening funnel going from 2016 to 2050 with the number of people who expected to age, given the fact of our current lifespans and so forth. So we know that so many more people are going to be challenged by, by dementias and Alzheimer's as they get older and older, which is why there's such an interest in exploring uh, newer kinds of treatments. So one of the things, and when we think about Alzheimer's, we always think about the memory component, the cognitive components, but I just want to emphasize that there's other sort of cognitive domains as well that can be involved, as well as language issues, as what we call executive functions. It's the ability to multitask is one example. And we always think about the functional impairment that someone can have. And in the later stages, they can get to the point where they have trouble bathing themselves or eating themselves or caring for themselves. Those are, those are our standard activities of daily living or ADLs. 
early on, we're looking for changes in what's called instrumental ADLs, difficulty balancing the checkbook, difficulty driving and navigating, keeping your own appointments. And then certainly a challenge for patients who suffer from this and their families is the behavioral symptoms. And it turns out that the behavioral and psychological symptoms oftentimes are the things that really impact families the most and oftentimes lead to people having to be put in nursing homes or institutions because the family members can no longer care for that component of the disease. So this is sort of a standard continuum of how sort of people think about the progression that one might have as you are on the path to developing Alzheimer's. So typically as we are getting older, we have normal cognition. And then now we have this concept, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this, of this pre-symptomatic Alzheimer's. And this becomes an important concept when we're talking about this new medication. And what it basically means is that you have no symptoms, you have no, you have no idea that this is happening, but the pathology is building up inside of your brain that may end up leading and progressing to more significant impairment, but it hasn't gotten to the point yet where it's causing symptoms. That's why it's pre-symptomatic. Uh, as you sort of go on, you get mild cognitive impairment. That is a term a lot of different things can cause mild cognitive impairment. We talked about that at the beginning from a variety of comorbidities and things like that. What that basically means is that there is objective cognitive dysfunction that we can see if we do a specialized memory test or cognitive test, but that you haven't yet gotten to that point where you have impairment in function, those activities of daily living, even the early ones, the instrumental ones. Once you get impairment of any function, then we're in the kind of dementia range, the Alzheimer's dementia range. And that's just kind of the, the thought process. It turns out that of people that have mild cognitive impairment, not everyone goes on to get dementia. The conventional wisdom is that 35 to 50% of people within the, over three years might start go on to evolve to kind of that early stage Alzheimer's. So some of the major pathological changes as we understand it that occur in Alzheimer's, there's just a generalized uh, shrinking, what we call an atrophy of the brain. And then there's kind of two main pathological processes that our scientists are really focused in on. One has to do with a protein called amyloid, in that when you have abnormal sort of processing of this protein, it falls together in clumps, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that. And the other is what are called tangles, and that has to do with a disruption of the skeleton of a cell or neuron, and that has to do with a protein called tau, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. If you add these things together, it leads to neuronal cell death, and then you get some neurotransmitter deficits, which means that the brain cells can't communicate with each other properly the way we send chemical messengers from one cell to another in various types of networks. So, Could you speak, could you speak louder, please? Sure. So a lot of what we're talking about with amyloid comes down to the processing of amyloid and that we kind of have some pathways that our body does which is not pathological, and so it has to do with this, um, what we call the amyloid beta uh, oligomer. And so in our body, we have these scissors. They're actually called enzymes that sort of cu cut these proteins at various places. If you cut it in the middle, that's good. That is going to not cause pathology. But it turns out we also have enzymes that are designed to sort of cut out that AB portion at the bottom. And so this is actually not a good thing to collect. And as it gets more and more, we'll talk about the ramifications of that. And when we talk about all the genetic components of Alzheimer's, it all comes back to what's happening here. There are some people who, um, the Icelandic mutations, they, their pathways do a lot more of this with the non-pathologic pathway. And then there's some earlier onset types of Alzheimer's people who unfortunately have a lot more activity of this at earlier stages, so they start sort of getting these pathological accumulations at much earlier ages. So a lot of what comes down to it is which pathway is your body doing that's creating these, uh, these oligomers of, these, of the amyloid beta. This amyloid precursor protein and how it's processed is a very important thing. And here's sort of an example of how you start off with this abnormal monomer, and then it's sort of those clump together and they form an oligomer, and those start forming chains. It's called a fibril, and then fibrils get together and form plaques. These tend to sort of hang out between neurons, kind of in the synapses. And when they get close to the neurons, they can actually affect the way they transmit, affect what's going in and out of the neuron, and it can cause sort of a, 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 cell, a programmed cell death uh, for those neurons. 
So there's some problems going on between the neurons, which is disrupting the function, and that's what amyloid is. And you sort of combine that with what's happening inside the neuron, and what we have is tau. A lot of people refer to tau as railroad tracks. These railroad tracks are providing a skeleton and a structure for the neuron. And if you disrupt that, if you pull apart those railroad tracks, then the whole neuron sort of unravels and comes apart. And it's almost kind of shrinking and dying from within. So when you think about it, this is sort of a, a really challenging disease when you have things happening between neurons that's affecting neuronal function and then disrupting the actual architecture of the neuron itself from within. And both of those things are happening at the same time. Now, there's a, there's a hypothesis known as the amyloid cascade hypothesis, which is actually a very important hypothesis to the medication we're talking about tonight, with the idea being that as you increase the production of this uh, amyloid beta oligomers and they form more plaques, that in and of itself sends signals to those railroad tracks to tell there are some things, there are some reactions that happen to those inside the neuron that gets what's called phosphorylated. And as you think about it, that phosphorylation is what kind of tears them apart, which unravels the skeleton, and that forms these tangles inside of the neurons. And these are things that pathologists look at when they look at the brain under a microscope. They can see these tangles inside the neuron. They can see these plaques uh, between the neurons. And you add these things together and you get more of that synaptic dysfunction, and you get the neur neuronal loss itself that leads to the atrophy, all these things that are leading to these memory loss and other types of cognitive deficits. And it's a vicious cycle And that the more sort of synaptic dysfunction and loss you have, it will sort of unfortunately trigger more of the functioning of the bad kind of the amyloid beta. And so when you put all this together, here's sort of a hypothetical model of what's happening of, the, uh, of these biomarkers or the pathologies of Alzheimer's. And that the very first, the traditional model is that first you have this accumulation in the orange of the amyloid beta. And see, this is all happening. And then that sort of after that, you get tau from inside. So that sort of follows that, that sort of linear path we, should, we talked about. But I want to just point out on this, if you can see my pointer, that that dotted line is where you first start developing symptoms of some cognitive symptoms that can be detected on testing. So the ma majority of this graph, you're cognitively normal, but these things are building up inside of you, the amyloid, which is triggering the tau. So then you sort of get to that mild cognitive impairment, that MCI. That's where you have objective cognitive deficits, but not yet actual functional impairment. And then unfortunately, you get the functional impairment. And by the time you get to this point of functional impairment, even if it's early Alzheimer's, you can actually see we're already dealing with a good load of amyloid and a good load of tau. And so that's just kind of the idea of what's going on. A lot of treatments have been sort of targeted over here in the dementia stages. And some of the thinking now is we need to start targeting earlier and earlier if we're going to make a difference before we get to the top of that curve. So there's a lot of people in the science, they really focus on amyloid. They think amyloid is the important uh, thing. There are some people who are big believers in tau. They think tau is the important thing. There's actually other types of neurodegenerative diseases which are in which tau is kind of more of an issue than amyloid. Uh, that's not necessarily the case in Alzheimer's. My personal theory is that there is something, it's not just amyloid or tau. It's not as linear as we, as we talked about in that amyloid cascade hypothesis. Um, I believe there's these very complicated interactions between both amyloid and tau in that if we don't sort of think about those interactions, we're not going to be as effective in sort of modifying this disease. This is just sort of my interpretation of what's going on with the literature. And then there's some things where we can see that as amyloid is accumulating, it's triggering some of these enzymatic reactions that sort of leads to the bad tau, and the bad tau leads to the amyloid. So there's this, a give and take between the amyloid and tau, which is really, uh, if we could find some way to sort of disconnect that give and take, we might have more of a chance at dealing with this better. So how do we know that these that those people had pre-symptomatic um, amyloid going on? They don't have cognitive symptoms. And so we've learned a lot from advances in neuroimaging. And so when we talk about clinical biomarkers, really there's two main things I'm going to mention. One is this advanced imaging, and the other is things we can find when we do a spinal tap, a lumbar puncture. So we know from imaging in the middle, this is a typical MRI, and you can kind of see more of the thinning. There's not as much of the gray matter 
on the left with the Alzheimer's compared to the normal individual. The top is a regular PET scan. That is a scan that measures sort of activity, you know, metabolic function, but it sort of measures it all at once, whereas the bottom scan is a specialized amyloid PET scan. It specifically measures how much amyloid is accumulating in the brain. In general, the bright red orange is bad. That's the amyloid. So you would like to be, have as little of that as possible in your brain. And this is why we know that there are some people, when we test them, when they get to be a certain age, that they're accumulating amyloid, even if they look great on tests and have no symptoms of cognitive dysfunction. And so this is one way of a, bio, of a biomarker we can do in someone who's otherwise healthy and alive of figuring out what's happening to that individual. We've had amyloid uh, PET scans for several years now, and during this past year, the FDA just approved the very first uh, TAL PET scan, and there's others on the horizon. So we'll be able to kind of study that as well to kind of compare where people are with their amyloid compared to TAL. The other biomarker that we can use is, as I said, the cerebrospinal fluid, where you can actually do a specialized test in, this, in the CSF. When you're looking for that phosphorylated TAL, that's the, the bad TAL, which is pulling apart the cytoskeleton, as well as the amyloid beta. And the pattern that you are looking for in that CSF is that you have an elevation in the P-tau, that's the bad tau. So you have a lot of that. And you actually have less in people with Alzheimer's of the amyloid beta, and that's a little bit counterintuitive. But the explanation is that the reason you have less is because so much of it is now clumped in those bad plaques. And if they're clumped in plaques, then they, they can't come out of solution to be tested in the cerebrospinal fluid. So it's been pretty much found that, that, that that's another sort of good objective scientific way that we can take on someone who's, who's otherwise alive and otherwise healthy of, of figuring out what's going on in their body if they are sort of at that point where they're at that pre-symptomatic point where there's evidence of, of these things accumulating in their body. So where are we today with drugs for Alzheimer's disease? There's only actually only four uh, before Adjuhelm that were approved for Alzheimer's. The first three, and they all affect the neurotransmitter function. They're really not getting at that disease mechanism. So the first three are trying to really uh, enhance a, a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine, which is really important in memory. And so we're trying to kind of keep it from breaking down and sort of maximize the function of acetylcholine. That's what those first three do. The other uh, really is, is a acts on receptors that are called NMDA receptors. It's another type of neurotransmitter in the brain that uses a different transmitter called glutamate. But basically, it is also trying to sort of maximize the function. So in, t uh, in general, the, the acetylcholine ones are approved for mild to moderate Alzheimer's, and the memantine, the glutamate one, is approved for moderate to severe Alzheimer's. Now, again, that's looking at neurotransmitter function. So here are some novel potential treatments that different scientists have looked at. So just kind of looking at agents targeting the amyloid beta pathology, and we're going to hone in on that tonight because that's what we're talking about. There have been attempts at looking at the tau pathology itself with agents targeting that. Looking at associated things like metabolic factors, we are learning more and more that inflammation is a very important part of driving this sort of train of the, of amy of the amyloid cascade hypothesis. So if we can sort of downregulate the inflammation, is that going to help? We have investigators looking at that as well as well as other things looking at neurotransmission. So honing in on the amyloid beta pathology, which is really what we're focusing in on, um, there's a number of things. we can. There's been attempts to rev up the very good scissors that sort of cuts up the bad kind of the, uh, of the, of the algomer. And then there's other times where we try and inhibit the bad scissors. Those have been attempts as well. I do want to talk about, we're kind of looking now at um, Aducanumab, which is just an anti-amyloid antibody. I'm going to show you that in a minute. But um, that's more of a passive type of immunization, if you will. Like we were just introducing the antibody to target amyloid. There, have, there were attempts a number of years ago to do active amyloid beta immunization to try and rev up the immune system to prevent this from happening at all. Those studies got stopped because of um, bad side effects. It caused inflammation where it would cause the whole brain to get inflamed, and encephalitis. And so, those, so that active immunization... Uh, look, sounded promising based on the mechanism, but was too dangerous to continue with. So now we're talking about passive immunization with these anti-amyloid antibodies, and there's been a number of them which have been targeted, kind of looking at these different parts of the abnormal amyloid beta. So there's actual an antibody that just binds just the soluble form. There's ones that bind the soluble and the fibrillar forms. And what aducanumab does, it specifically is targeting the fibrillar form 
and the plaques kind of later on in that sort of development where we talked about as these things accumulate in a bad way. So that is kind of the theory of trying to get something that's going in amyloid, which is involved in the, in the disease evolution, trying to find a medication, which is going to be disease modifying as opposed to just trying to target symptoms. We don't have a disease modifying treatment yet. So there's been a lot of hope and promise and was really hoped that this would be an answer. So there was two main uh, studies that were used to look at this clinically, emerge and engage. Now, both of these studies were done on either that mild cognitive impairment, the objective cognitive dysfunction on testing, but not yet in any impairment in function, or very early AD, very early impairments in function. And these individuals who were part of this test, there was evidence of some amyloid accumulation via biomarkers, PET scans or the CSF. And the studies occurred over 18 months. They had two main endpoints. One was looking at the amyloid load, and one was looking at the cognitive measures. I'm going to go through that with you, but I'm going to give you the bottom line first. They did a great job at decreasing amyloid. There's really no controversy over that. Uh, the controversy is that they really had a questionable or correlation with whether it was doing anything meaningful to the cognition for the individual. And so here's, I just want to show you kind of how the differences of what this looks. This is the amyloid, and so area under the curve of how much amyloid did they have, and you can see the placebo is these red lines, and so as time went on, they were slowly accumulating more amyloid, but the people who got the medicine, there was, an, there was a drop. As it goes down, there's less amyloid. You would think that's good because you're trying to get rid of the pathological thing. That looks promising. So that part, no one's really debating whether it did or did not deplete amyloid. It does look like it's decreasing amyloid. And you can actually see that. Here's an example of some of the images from the studies. Again, the red or orange is not good. These are the placebo people. There was really, if anything, a mild accumulation in their follow-up. And the people who got aducanumab, you can see the baselines here, the follow-up here, and you can actually appreciate that in many of these people, there's less of that orange or red, especially in these medial temporal lobe areas where memory structures live, like the hippocampus. So you can actually appreciate, just looking at the scan, uh, that there was some decrease in amyloid that was going on there. Here's the rub. Here is kind of an example of what's happening with the cognitive baseline. And that's kind of the thing that affects us day to day. And so in the, um, so between emerge and engage, I'm going to start with uh, Engage over here. What they're using is something called the Clinical Dementia Rating Scale, sum of boxes. And so that takes six different domains. Uh, you get a score of um, up to three. So basically, the maximum score you could have is 18. So we're talking about basically an 18-point score. And what is unusual here is an Engage. Here is the high-dose aducanumab, and here's the people with placebo. They look pretty much the same. It's like the placebo people did not get worse, uh, even though they weren't getting treatment. So this was really um, confusing. And for some reason, the lower dose maybe looked a little bit better, uh, possibly, if you sort of look at this. But so the main issues of where the cognitive argument ca came from was with the eMERGE. So here's the placebo in gray. And then this makes sense. You have sort of, you're continuing to get worse. Here's the low dose. And here's the high dose. So the high dose is you're getting worse at a slower rate. But let's take the placebo and the get worse. And we talked about it was an 18-point scale. It's about 0.33 difference here. So the question is, uh, 0.33 on an 18-point scale, how much does that make a difference in day-to-day -day life? And that's kind of the debate as to what's happening there. And so it really kind of raises more questions about sort of the clinical efficacy or the clinical outcome of what's going on with this medication. So why, so there's controversy. So how did this medicine get approved? What happened at the FDA? There was an advisory panel. The advisory panel does just that. They give advice to the FDA and the FDA makes decisions. The vast majority of the time, the FDA follows the advice of their panel. This panel had 11 members. 10 of the 11 advised against approval. One abstained because they thought there was not enough data to make a decision one way or the other. Uh, it turns out the, and th when the panel met, they were looking at it as a traditional FDA medication or therapy. Uh, the FDA, when they met privately, they approved this using an accelerated approval pathway, which a lot of us have now learned about this pathway. I have to admit, I wasn't as aware of this pathway until this happened. Um, and so what this pathway is for is if you can prove there's a change in a biomarker, 
but there's unclear clinical things, then you can approve the medicine while you're doing more clinical studies, and then the FDA has the right to remove its approval if the clinical studies don't show a difference. In this case, uh, the company was given nine years to complete the study. Um, uh, the other things that happen is usually if you're going to do that, your advisory panel is supposed to make a recommendation for the traditional pathway and a recommendation for the alternative pathway. They were never told that the alternative pathway was even an option. So the only recommendations that came were for the traditional pathway, and they were never called back to talk about this other sort of uh, development. So I would just say this, for an, for an alternate pathway then, a major consideration would be safety. You'd really want to go back and make sure that what you're doing is safe um, as you're sort of doing the clinical. And I'm going to sort of hold on to that because I'm going to get into that in the next slide. Some other things that happened when the FDA approved this medicine, it was approved for all severities of Alzheimer's. And when we talk about, I didn't talk about this earlier, but for Alzheimer's, we have that early or mild, moderate or severe. And so it was actually approved for all that. Now the studies that they did were only in, in mild cognitive impairment and early AD. And so puzzlingly, even though there was no data about its use in moderate to severe, and we talked about how it's going to be more challenging just based on how much amyloid and tau is there in the moderate to severe, it was still approved. In some of the blowback one month later, they changed the indication and the FDA had put out an official statement to say, okay, now we want to make this just indicated for MCI and early AD to be more in line with the clinical studies that were used for the approval. Um, significant numbers of the advisory panel publicly resigned and Health and Human Services, that's the cabinet level department of which the FDA falls under, they have an inspector general investigation ongoing as to what happened with the approval of this. Um, so let's get back to that safety issue. So it turns out there's, some, there's kind of a different type of side effect that happens with this medicine when you are affecting amyloid and perhaps creating or releasing more amyloid into the system. It's called amyloid-related imaging abnormalities. Um, it's called ARIA is the acronym. And this table that I'm showing you here, I'm not going to go through the details of it, but I just want to point out this table is copied from the FDA instructions, from the FDA guide for this medicine, which tells providers how to prescribe this medicine. And they even sort of, um, there's kind of two different types of things. You can cause edema, that's swelling of the brain, and you can cause microhemorrhages. As a neurologist, we're usually in the business of trying to avoid things that cause edema or hemorrhages and treating them to preventing them from happening in the future. But this is an important side effect that's known to happen with this medication. In fact, they even put gradations of this into mild, moderate, and severe. And some more facts about this uh, am ARIAs, the amyloid-related imaging abnormalities, it was found in 41% of patients. That is not an insignificant number. Uh, and of them, it wasn't like they were all mild. The vast majority of them were of the moderate severity. And of those who had this, 24% had clinical symptoms, which ranged from headache, more confusion, vertigo. So the playbook for this, we don't know. It's not like this is something that we're trained in as neurologists. How do you manage this? So basically, the, the conservative aspect has been hold the medicine and see what happens. And so they held the medicine, and the symptoms got better. And in, in most cases, 91%, the actual imaging abnormalities improved as well. But that's a lot of time going by when you're not giving this medicine, which is a monthly medicine, and more amyloid is continuing to accumulate. So this requires monitoring. So in, in an important part of this medicine is you have to have a, an MRI done before you start treatment, and then MRI is done before the 7th and 12th treatments, infusions, just to see what's going on, because sometimes it might be there and you may not know because you don't have symptoms and you don't want to continue to, to kind of worsen that. So the instructions for providers that are in the FDA instructions are, quote, show clinical vigilance. They don't tell you what that means, but that is the most, that's the instructions that we have. I worry about, we know that infl inflammation is an important part of these, of the overall pathways for developing Alzheimer's. And so when you have swelling when you have microhemorrhages, I wonder if that's actually triggering some other pathways down the line, which may be sort of accelerating or causing some problems down the line. We don't know, but I think it's a worthy question and not an unreasonable question to ask. Some practical considerations we need to, uh, if you're going to give this medicine, you need to make sure that amyloid is there in the individual. You're giving an anti-amyloid medicine. You want to make sure that person has amyloid. 
there have been some studies in the past where people look like they clinically look like all the world they had Alzheimer's you do some testing and they don't have amyloid so they would not be a candidate so you want to make sure that the individual that you're doing that you're targeting the right thing so amyloid so the two ways of doing this is an amyloid pet like we talked about or the CSF biomarkers now it turns out that amyloid pet although has been great in research to helping us understand the pathophysiology and helping us understand the pre-symptomatic people in day-to-day -day clinical use it is not approved by insurance you cannot get an amyloid pet approved by an insurance company there's been a lot of studies there's been a lot of advocacy for that it just is we're not there they're not doing it so the only choice you have is with CSF biomarkers which means you're going to have to subject the patient to a spinal tap um, it used to be that this was an ex uh, that there's two main commercial labs that would do this for you there's an additional cost but uh, interestingly enough since this medicine has been released Biogen is now sponsoring and paying for all costs for any patients to kind of run this test, um, and you can sort of imagine why. So Mayo Clinic and Athena Labs are the two main labs which kind of do this specialized test, and they and it is now free to patients um, because of Biogen. Because of this whole issue of the microhemorrhages happening from this amyloid-related imaging, there's a lot of people of that age group who are on blood thinners for a variety of reasons, and so if you are on a blood thinner, it's now considered a relative contraindication against taking this medicine because you might be more at risk for developing those, those microhemorrhages. And just this is not a pill that you take. This is a monthly IV infusion. So there's a lot of logistics that go into that. Um, so what about what's happening at the University of Florida? Aducanumab is not currently offered at the University of Florida. No request has been made to add it to our formulary. And there's a, there's a trend or a pattern. Many academic institutions have chosen not to offer this medicine. So we're not alone in that. And, and we're not out on a limb on that. I, and I, I would say most of the academic institutions who I've interacted with have made similar choices. They've done their own risk benefit. They've looked at the data themselves. And I think we've all independently come to that conclusion. But certainly there are still other places that are that may be willing to offer it. We're just not one of them at, at the current time. And so. Um, Hopefully, I have provided some background. I know there's some additional concerns and, and issues to talk about. Just want to give some credits to uh, um, some of the slides that were borrowed here. And with that background and context, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Southwick, who is going to sort of talk to us about some of these additional um, economic and public concerns. Great. Uh, Mike, that was superb. Um, we'll hold the question just so I finish this, and then we'll have our breakout sessions. This, uh, this is fairly quick. Um, as, as an organization, the Right Care Alliance, um, our mantra is patients before profits and making healthcare affordable. And in thinking about affordability, one of the things that many healthcare systems and many uh, researchers are, are very interested in is um, a value of care. So first of all, Let's, uh, Mike has, has really uh, summarized the trials, but one thing he did not mention, the trials were stopped because of futility. What that means is they did not see a significant difference in cognitive function and they stopped the trials. But then what happened is Biogen went on and analyzed what they had. And they found this one subgroup in one of the studies that showed a minor cognitive improvement. And that was the basis for going back, going from 1.34 to 1.75, 1.74, uh, that was all the improvement. So in an 18 point scale. So the F, the, they went back to the FDA and then they had this, ra this uh, accelerated uh, uh, approval because of the decrease in amyloid. Now, in looking at the criteria for the FDA, they have to say that they have to determine whether it's safe and effective. Now, based on what uh, was just, just presented and based on my reading, I don't think they've proven it's safe or effective, but nonetheless, it was approved. The, uh, then the FDA reason the drug reduces the surrogate endpoint amyloid in the brain plaque. And another point that should be noted is all the expert statisticians that looked at this large trial uh, were opposed to approval because when you have one small subgroup that has a tiny significant difference 
that can happen by chance. Now, um, now Medicare has got to approve this. And this is where you come into the concept of, is this a value? Now, the, the definition of value is quality divided by cost. Now, quality in this case would be improving qu uh, the quality of cognitive function. And I would submit to you that based on this study, the quality of the, uh, the treatment is low. The cognitive outcome is plus or minus. And there's the danger of false hope. Furthermore, there is a potential danger and 40% had intracerebral hemorrhages. Wow, I mean, I can't, I think this is very low quality. And then what's the cost? I didn't mention that, but it's $56,000 per year. That's just for the drug itself. The administrative costs, et cetera, are, are, are even higher. So I would submit to you, this, is, this would be considered low value care. CMS criteria for coverage are reasonable and necessary. I don't think either of those criteria are fill, fulfilled. And as, as uh, Mike, Michael mentioned, CMS doesn't even cover PET, PET scans to look for beta amyloid, which is the key criteria for which you would treat with this drug. And I looked up a, a, a average beta amyloid PET scan cost four to $5,000 each. And presumably you'd have to do at least two or three of those on top of the $56,000. And then you need to monitor side effects. And a, a MRI, each MRI costs $2,500. Um, so that you would have to do at least three of those. So that's even more money. So it's at least it's between 60 and $70,000 per year for this drug. Now, what does that mean from a coverage standpoint? Physician, and this is a physician administered therapy and under Medicare Part B, that's where it would be taken from. 72% of which was financed by general taxes. If there was a 10% uptake on this drug, uh, that would be nearly 6 million US patients with Alzheimer's, 10%. That would overall drug expenditures for Part D would increase by 88% from 37 million to 60, or 37 billion to $67 billion. If it was a 30% uptake in this drug, it would increase 262% to 134 billion. That would translate for taxes for each individual of $211 per person. And of interest, with a 10% uptake, uh, the revenue for Biogen is $32 billion. This is big money. And is this patients before profits? CMS, so far, if they do refuse to pay, we don't know, they haven't made a decision, then the patient and family would have to pay and Biogen would probably implement a tiered pricing, and it would mean that low-income families uh, could not receive the drug. Quite frankly, I'm not sure that that's a bad thing at this point, but uh, Michael may be able to comment more. And uh, the other thing that they could do is they could use CMS value-based payment. That is, you would only, they would only reimburse uh, the, uh, the administering uh, the doctor or health system if there was significant improvement in cognitive function. If there was no improvement, they wouldn't pay. So uh, obviously a lot, most health systems would not wanna take that risk, which would mean that it would not be delivered. So uh, CMS cover only if it was a clinical trial, a phase four or required by FDA. And right now, uh, Michael, you can maybe comment on this more. It's not really clear that they're, ma uh, they're mandating a phase four and what uh, we've had some people, Sandy called around to infusion centers and it sounds like if a doctor orders it, they will give it. So um, what, what, why don't we stop uh, any questions at this point? And then after we finish the questions, we wanna break out into three uh, uh, rooms about three potential campaigns because uh, we in the uh, Right Care Alliance feel that it's still early in the course and the promotions have been, they've so far Biogen has not heavily promoted this. So there's time to actually get the information across before the sensational ads come through. And so uh, Gary uh, has, uh, has contacted the AARP and 
We're wondering about actions that they might be able to take. We're wondering how what community actions would be most effective. And then the third breakout room will be health systems. How do we convince other health systems not to prescribe or promote the Agihelm? And we're going to share on the on the chat a link to a um, a uh, actual a promise you can make. You can sign a promise saying. Uh, you are not going to promote Agihelm. If you're a doctor, you're not going to prescribe it. If you're a patient or a family member, you are going to discourage taking it. Uh, because we think that, uh, that having this uh, pledge um, will actually, we can share the large number. So far, we have 134 people that have signed this pledge. And if you, after reviewing all this data, feel that, that this is the right way to go, then you can sign this pledge. So, um, and if, at this point, any questions for, for our Michael? You can send them in the chat if you have them. I thought that was, by the way, very clear. Stephen Dukoski, uh, RAE is not associated with hemorrhage, only RIAH. Risk is not high in the ARIH. Can you come on that, Michael? Um, so, Steve is correct. So the 40% covers all arias. And so that is kind of the argument is that this is, would you know it's there if you didn't do an MRI? So for asymptomatic people, you wouldn't. So that's the question is, so is safety based on symptoms? Um, that is one point of view, but the other aspect like I wonder about is, even if you don't have symptoms, is the fact that it's there going to cause some other types of problems with other pathways, which is unknown. And so I, so personally, I sort of am concerned about that unknown and taking that risk. Okay, yeah. And uh, another question, Kathy Kidder asked, when did FDA approval happen? Uh, that was the beginning of June. Yeah, so it's, 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 uh, it's quite recently and I tell you, it's been a tremendous storm over this. So um, if there are no more questions that we'd like to break out, you can choose between the three rooms. And, uh, oh, Shirley, you had a question? Yes, I am wondering if the alternate pathway for approval is continuing thing for all drugs in the future, and if we have any way to further address that problem. Yeah, well, I, I, that is one of the things that the Right Care Alliance is very concerned about. Uh, the original history, this was used originally for uh, uh, antiretroviral drugs, for HIV, because there was great concern that the, the development was too slow. And by the time they proved its efficacy, too many people were dying. And so it's really, and that turned out to be very, very helpful in the case of HIV drugs. Um, I, the question here, I mean, but the HIV drugs didn't cost uh, one pill that, or one year's worth didn't cost 36,000 or $56,000. So, and Alzheimer's a little different than, than uh, dying of HIV. So it's there, they aren't exactly the same. And the question is, should this pathway have been used in this case? And I, I can't really speak to that, but I, I think it was uh, there are a lot of people who feel that maybe this wasn't uh, the right way to go, uh, but uh, I don't know. Michael, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I think at the end of the day, what we're seeing is because there has really no, it's been a long time since we've had any new approved medicine for Alzheimer's. It is a disease which is ravaging many people and their families' lives. And there is a hunger or a desire to have a medicine that targets the disease mechanism rather than just trying to get at these symptoms that we had. So there's this enthusiasm that I think that that may have contributed to its approval. And so it's something that um, there are other antibodies. We saw some of them that are in the pipeline. And so we want to kind of use this as a lesson to make sure as we're looking at these newer medicines. And I'm hoping that although this is, doesn't seem to be the answer with the data we have for Alzheimer's is that we can use as a lesson and with the knowledge that we have that maybe we can find a disease modifying drug that will have the clinical benefits. Yeah. From a scientific perspective, is it that we need to give it earlier in the disease? 
did it did it uh, was eighteen months enough to see an effect? These are questions we don't know, but these are all sort of lessons we can think about as we're looking at other diseases, other drugs that are in the pipeline. Yeah, and Steve Nicasi said the alternate pathway is only for diseases with urgent needs for treatment, and they was not brought up by the advisory committee, as you pointed out, Michael, and and the price proposed by the company was not made public until after the approval. So wow, there are a lot of um, a lot of problems here. A lot of problems here.